You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 18. Welcome back, I'm Gavin Webber and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. I'll have a special guest this week, it's Ian Truer and he is from Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. Now, Ian has a great blog called Much To Do About Cheese and he's been a home cheesemaker for quite a while now. So uh, it was a really interesting episode, uh, a great interview and I learnt a lot from Ian. Uh, so let's get on with the interview. Now you run a very successful blog called Much to Do About Cheese. Now what's with the, what's with the Shakespearean twist there? Uh I I wasn't too uh keen on what I called it before, which was Pop-Tarts and Schnitzel, which uh <laughs> originally started, <laughs> uh originally started out as a uh, just a food blog for me to vent about uh food. I didn't actually think anybody read it. Yeah. <laughs> which was surprising when I started getting comments. And then I uh, took a poll from some of my friends, and uh, someone suggested uh, Much Ado About Cheese. Yeah. But there's a YouTube channel that already has that name, so I didn't want to run the risk of uh, getting in trouble with them. And uh, then in talking to my wife, she suggested Much To Do hmm. About Cheese. Which, yep. And I've always been a Shakespeare fan. Um, I probably have about... Uh, well, right now I'm reading Macbeth for probably about the fourth time, so. Yeah, the Scottish play. It's very cool. <laughs> mixed, in, mixed in with a little Walking Dead on the side. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a bit of a fan of the Walking Dead as well. But I don't make cheese, though. So, Ian, why did you start making cheese? Uh, sometimes I ask myself that, that same question. Um uh, always been a fan of cheese. And then some trips to Europe when I was in my teens with my parents. Um, I discovered there was more to life uh, with cheese than just cheddar and uh, cheese whiz. And uh, it wasn't until uh, later on in, in life, probably about uh, almost five years now, that uh, I was looking for a hobby. And uh, I've been known to frequent a few cheese shops here in, uh, in Edmonton. And I just got kind of tired of uh, paying some of the prices, even though, to be honest, it was worth it. And I thought, why not give uh, cheese making a try? Uh, it was that or making beer, and I don't really drink, so yeah. beer would have been a bit of a waste. So that's fantastic. So then what was your first cheese? The first cheese I tried was a uh, just something that got off the internet. It was a, uh, uh, a vinegar, just a ba- supposed to be your basic vinegar uh, and milk cheese, oh, but right. I read the instructions wrong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I ended up getting a, uh, a hockey puck. Right, rock hard. Yes. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize I was supposed to uh, turn the heat off after adding the vinegar. Oh, right, yeah. So the just kept on cooking and cooking, and I'm like, this is not working out. Yeah. And I drained it. It was the lovely little puck. Nice. And did it, what did it taste like? A hockey puck? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It tasted like rubber. So so uh, after that failure, what, what, what made you think, oh, I better keep going? I realized I could do probably do better, and the fact that I like getting uh, doing research, um, so I started researching about it. And then uh, for Father's Day one year, my uh, my wife and my son bought me a kit from a uh, supplier, and uh, it turned out infinitely better. Yeah. Even though the instructions from the kit were for, uh, I think it was for five hundred liters of milk, <laughs> and Goodness I was my. using eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. That one turned out better, even though it was a bit strong, uh, strong flavor, because I used the entire package of culture and eight liters of milk, not paying yeah. attention then. So. Yeah, it would have been very cheesy flavor then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so out of the ashes, Rose, what's the next cheese? Um, your car Philly. Oh, nice. So that's uh, at that point in time, I started doing a... Uh, a lot more research and I stumbled across your website and your, your YouTube videos. And, and from there, I just kind of 
said I need to do uh, do something better. And then I watched your, I think I watched your Carfilly video probably about three or four times before I attempted it. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic cheese, Carfilly. It's one of my favorites, that's for sure. We just, uh, yesterday, we had a big family dinner. And so that was one of the uh, items on the on the cheese plate I put out was uh, my latest Carfilly. So. Yeah, I saw the photo of that. I thought, that's fabulous. It looks just like mine. <laughs> I didn't realize you were using my recipe. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually great. Actually, when I was working at uh, uh, one of the things that cheese making has helped me do is I got to work for 10 months at a local artisan producer, and I actually introduced a bit of the Carfilly, your Carfilly recipe with a few minor changes for larger scale. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the cheeses we were producing for a while. So that was the Smoky Valley Goat Cheese Company? Yes, yes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that, mate. We started out working with a uh, myself and a couple of other Edmonton food bloggers started a uh, program called Cheese Palooza. Yeah, what's Palooza? Was a, what, what's Palooza stand for? Oh, what's it was it mean? kind of a takeoff on uh, there was this Lala Palooza, which was a music festival. Right. And then there was uh, another group of bloggers that did uh, Charcuta Palooza, which was a whole sausage and cheese make uh, sausage and charcuterie making monthly challenge type thing. Yeah. And uh, I said it, the name as a joke, and it actually kind of stuck. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never heard the word here in Australia. That's all. Uh, yeah, it's. I think it all started from Lollapalooza. I'm not too sure either. It just means a great deal of things, I guess. So. All right. So it sounds like a bit of a festival type thing. Yes. And so we did this monthly, uh, every month we got a different cheese that we selected that we all had to make, and then we blogged about it. Yeah. And we were lucky the uh, time we got to do feta was uh, we also arranged a trip out to visit Smoky Valley. Right. So because they were going to be making feta out of, a, uh, out of their goat smoke at that time. So we went out for the day, and then uh, I struck up a friendship with the owners. Um, and uh, then they invited me back uh, a couple of weeks later to help out with another workshop. And that uh, just kind of uh, blossomed from there. And then in, uh, and then I started getting a little bit of an honorarium for helping out with the workshops. And then, uh, then I started actually working with them, doing uh, market days and... Uh, and a few other, uh, and actually helping out with uh, the actual production of the cheese. Oh, okay, fabulous. So you're working there part time, full time. I know well, you're I finished was, now. Yeah, I was I was working there part time because I still work for a local uh, technical uh, college. Yep. So that's uh, that uh, uh, is a, my Monday through uh, Friday job, and then I was working on the weekends with uh, with the dairy. So what? What were the what were the main differences other than volumes of milk that you saw between home cheese making, which you just started, and then commercial cheese making? Tell us something about the differences there. The aging rooms for the first bit, like there was no fighting with trying to keep the humidity in my tiny little uh, fridge up because <laughs> we had this, these huge rooms that were climate controlled. Well, I, I don't know if I'd say they're huge, but they were they were large rooms where we climate controlled in there, and then to get the humidity, we just poured a little water on the floor, and that would usually be good for about a week to maintain about uh, eighty-five to ninety-five percent humidity. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And uh, just learning uh, some of the rules for uh, pasteurization, in uh, especially adhering to the pasteurization laws here in Canada, which. Uh, state the raw milk cheeses have to be aged a minimum of 60 days yeah and we produced uh, like a valence and a same more which were at 60 days they'd be liquid inside yeah, yeah. so uh, we had to do the pasteurization so i had to be present to actually see a couple of pasteurization runs so it was a lot uh, a lot different than just going to the store and buying uh, buying the milk so. yeah it is isn't it yeah so they pasteurized um, their soft cheeses. What did they do? Any hard cheeses? Uh, yes, yes. We were doing. Uh, we even had a quota for cow's milk, which is uh, we had to go through Alberta Dairy to get. And we were doing some uh, two versions of uh, Carefilly, uh, regular one that we named Collingwood after one of the markets that we went to, and one that we ripened with uh, ARN, which is a combination of bee linens and gave it a nice kind of red terracotta. 
a Rhine, and that one was called Red Water. Nice. Uh, we, we did a, uh, a test batch of uh, Emmental, which we didn't get any eyes develop in. <laughs> that yeah. problem myself. <laughs> Um, that one actually was uh, kind of nice, and then um, the uh, they do a goat tom, which is uh, which is a raw milk cheese, also the Pyrenees uh, style of uh, goat smoked cheese as well, which was uh, a hard raw milk cheese. Yeah, yeah. So that would age for obviously longer than the sixty days required. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah we- they, that one there, I think they did uh, the last batch before. Uh, before my time ended with them, we uh, it was about five months before we uh, we even tried that one to see if it was ready. Yeah, and and did it turn out all right? Oh, it turned out brilliantly. Yeah. So it was uh, it was really nice. I I, I did learn a lot about uh, uh, the aging side of things as well. Mm. And sanit- well, yeah, and sanitation. What's the, the difference between home and and commercial? They must go over the top, really, for that. Oh, oh, a lot. Like the they actually had proper dairy soap. Dairy soap, uh, yeah. Dairy soap, uh, that stuff is brilliant. You get a little bit of curd stone on there. Yeah. On on the vat, you just uh, add a little dairy soap on there, and it cuts through it like a hot knife through butter. A lot of sanitation. Um, It was a bit of an eye opener in one aspect. I like to think I I I, uh, maintain good sanitary practices at home with uh, with my cheese making, but the uh, there it was step by step had to do certain steps to make sure that everything was uh, above board and uh, because uh, not only do they uh, they have to adhere to Alberta dairy regulations but uh, Alberta health services our uh, health department comes in and inspects at least once every uh, four to six weeks oh goodness yeah and does their swabs and the whole bit yeah yeah I suppose yeah and that's one of the most important things of cheese making even at home so you know, sanitization. If you don't get that right, then you're not going to get a regular sort of product. You're not going to get right. a, a consistent product is, is the word I was looking for. Right. So what sort of cheeses other than, um, so they're, they're the ones you made at the factory. So you made Kefili next. So what? tell us about your list of cheeses. Oh, I've done uh, Goudas, uh, lots of them. Yep, so wash curd, uh, yeah. Wash curd. Yep. Uh, I've done some Havarti's. Uh, one that, uh, I wasn't paying attention to when I was washing it with the brine and I actually had a glass of stout next to me. So I think there's a lesson in that, um, but I accidentally dipped the, uh, my cheesecloth into the stout and started washing the, the Havarti with that. So, and, and was that a bit of a serendipitous moment? Uh, yes, actually it, uh, I, I, I've made that cheese twice since and it's, uh, just a Guinness washed Havarti. And, and how's, how's and, uh, it turn out? It, it's brilliant. It's uh, it's an amazing cheese. Lots of nice flavor to it. And and the longer it ages, it actually gets quite strong. Oh, okay. Where My is... son kind of nicknamed it an Irish Dane. An Irish Dane. Well, there's a good name. Write that one down and stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the, what are the cheeses in your repertoire? I've done quite a few uh, semi-lactics lately that I've nicknamed my little squirrels. Uh, yeah, yeah, what's that come from? I noticed that on your website. So they're like a little. Um, it, it's kind. It's a. It's a mold ripened cheese with um, penicillium candidum and and what you're using GM triotrichum as well. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like a camembert, but it's not really spongy in the middle. Right. It. Uh, um, the last one I made, actually, part of the ones we had um, yesterday, it actually turned out quite nice. It was starting to get really, really soft around the edges, and it, it stems back because uh, I was a reservist for 20 years, and then we always called the guys off doing their secret little thing, the Secret Squirrel Society. And uh, so uh, for a while there, I wasn't telling anybody about this cheese, so I was calling it my little secret squirrel cheese. Nice. And then once I started telling some friends about it, then they said, "Well, you can drop the secret part now." So <laughs> it's not so; it's just your little squirrel. Right. So it's just kind of stuck. So very nice, very nice. And have you got that recipe up on your site? No, actually, I haven't. Uh, I haven't perfected it yet. So it's still a and secret then. It well, it's it's based on a. <laughs> Uh, a charu recipe, right? No, I so haven't heard of that. It's a it's a a, a twelve hour 
12 to 24 hour ripening period. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a lot longer than camembert. Right. And then it's uh, drained for uh, 48 hours. Goodness me. Oh, it's, uh, it's, I call it my set and forget. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a cheese. So yeah. It sounds, sounds, I get it. it's very, sounds very much like um, when you make a cream cheese, you leave it for ages and you don't care, you let it drain and stuff. Right. Um, but yeah, it sounds like you add a lot more goodies to it to the start. So. So it sounds very impressive, Ian, and it looks impressive on your site. I might put a picture up in the show notes. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, no problems at all. So I was just reading through your blog, and it looks like you've... What, what the heck is the League of Home Cheesemakers? What's that all about? Oh, that's uh, a bunch of us that were still part of the um, the Cheese Palooza project, which was, uh, which was only supposed to last about a year. We decided to, well, I, I contacted a few of them to see if we wanted to do something as a group. Right. And there's a, a group of uh, the League of Urban Cheesemakers in San Francisco. And I emailed one of their uh, members and asked them how they set up their group of home cheesemakers just to just to get a sense of uh, what they did to see how we could apply it to just members in Edmonton. Is that Caitlin? Yes, Oh, yeah, right. from Milk Sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool blog she's got too. Yeah. And um, so there's about uh, seven of us right now. Uh, we had our first meeting in uh, December, uh, beginning of December. And it was about minus uh, 25, minus 30 that night. So <laughs> oh, uh, there ended up being only, uh, only about five of us at the actual first gathering just because it was uh, pretty cold. Yeah. So. And uh, we did the uh, evening of uh, Bloomy Rhine cheeses. So oh, nice. everybody had their uh, their own cheeses. And I, I brought uh, my uh, larger-than-life camembert, which I nicknamed the Camem Bundy. I saw the size of that thing. Was that... <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. I don't know how it stayed together. Luck and sheer force of will. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, we've got a series of, uh, we're going to be meeting every couple of months uh, just to give us time to actually prepare and actually ripen our cheeses to the right uh, right time. So the next one is a uh, wash curd right. evening. And, and so you pick any wash curd, your favourite, obviously, and, right. and you stick with that theme. So then everybody brings the same, yeah? Uh, everybody brings the, we try to make it the same, but if someone doesn't particularly want to make a Gouda, or a, a Havarti, if there's another wash curd they want to bring, they can bring it themselves, bring yeah. that one as well. So. Yeah, cool. Sounds fantastic. And it's a great way to bring um, fellow cheesemakers together and and to learn, I suppose, the night you talk about, well, cheese, I suppose, once you're <laughs> eating it. And yes. Do you judge each other's cheese? Does it go that far, does it? Uh, it's, 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 we, we make, uh, we make comments about it. I don't know if we would say judging, but, uh, <laughs> We'd uh, we just make uh, if someone says, "Well, I didn't like how this turned out." Does anybody have any uh, have any suggestions to make it better? Then we we discuss it. I think there was probably only one conversation that wasn't pertaining to cheese all evening. So, <laughs> yeah, now, that sounds like a great way to uh, to learn and improve the craft. It really does. It's uh, it's something that I've you know I've been thinking about here in um, in Melbourne. Surely there's got to be some home cheesemakers around. I can't be the only one. Um, I know around the rest of Australia, I've contacted quite a few, but I really, I think it's something really interesting to start up. So well done, mate. Feather out of uh, feather out of your cap there. <laughs> now, well, it certainly has been. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Sorry. I, I was about to say it certainly has been fun, and and um, it has definitely uh, increased the 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 circle of friends I do have, and. And uh, we even found out that one of the members actually is originally from Belgium, so he's just actually been in Canada since September. So. Oh right. So um, did he do? Did he make cheese back in um, in Belgium when he was living there? No, actually, he's just a, uh, been going since about uh, September when uh, he wasn't pleased with the selection of cheeses he could get uh, <laughs> here. So wanted so, to make something he liked. So make your own. Why not? Now, mate, you've been teaching, though, you were teaching at Smoky Valley some basic courses, yeah? Yes. Yeah, but you're going to go whole hog public courses type thing in spring, is that right? Um, I'm teaching a class for uh, continuing education here in Edmonton. 
It's a one day course, just an introduction to cheese making. We're going to be doing a three cheeses. We've got eight hours. Yeah. So it's uh it's a big, big step for me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah. so I'm going to put that link. Now, have you got a full class yet or not? Uh, we've got six students signed up last time I checked. So how many more um, do you need? There's room for 12. Okay, what I'll do, I'll put that on the show notes. So if any budding cheesemakers in Edmonton, you never know, you never know, um, <laughs> might read my blog. But, uh, yeah, I'll put that up. I'll put the link in the show notes as well, Ian. Oh, thank you very much. No problems at all. Now, you've been talking about some of your wonderful successes and a few of your failures at the start. What's been your worst cheese ever? Uh, for the longest time, it was mozzarella. Really? Just a quick 30-minute mozzarella. I, I think I'm, I still have about 20 failures to 10 successes. Well, uh, I think I've got you, it licked now. You figured out what it was? Um, I'm pretty sure it was the milk. All oh, right, okay. And and just me being impatient as well too. So now the bane of my existence I have to say is camembert. Right. Now I saw a fantastic recipe for camembert on a uh, Gherkin's site um uh, artisan cheese making at home or something like that. I think that that's his website. I'll put that in the show notes as well. And it was amazing that he actually didn't give too much uh, care about um, when the cheese is draining. He just puts it in baskets and stacks them on top of each other and uses the gravity of one cheese to to press the other cheese, um, right. which is very similar to the way I make feta. So that that was a bit of an eye opener because I was doing the whole mats thing and you know turning it and and it was a pain in the bottom. And then uh, the salting, I'd always stuff that up. So you know I think I'm quite similar to you with um, camembert because. I've had about two failures to about three successes. Um, even though when I started to add in uh, geotrichum, it, the successes got more and more because that seems to firm up the skin and the rind and, and stops it from getting sloppy and all sorts of weird things that happen. Um, but yeah, with, with his recipe, uh, by brining it, I think that's fantastic. What, something as simple as that, what the heck? And that's a great way to get consistent salt into your cheese, so... The, um, the the cultures will, and the bacteria work properly. Yeah, the next time I try it, which is uh, my mother's been bugging me for a decent camembert, so uh, when she comes up in the spring, I'm going to be uh, trying his recipe. Yeah, I, that's the next one I'm going to try as well. Yeah, so no, and he's, he, he's got a wealth of um, information. He lives in Canberra, which is about 700 kilometres away from us, north to the north of us in our nation's yep. capital, so... Yeah, I'd love to catch up with um, Gurkhan one day. It'd be fantastic to uh, go and check out all his cheeses and stuff. He makes massive big ones too. <laughs> We're talking about four or five kilo cheese. I don't know how he's what the pot he's got, and I didn't see any of that, but it'd be so good to go and check it out. I'm stuck on eight litres to probably about 14 if I'm going to make a double batch. Anyway, cool. Thanks for um, thanks for your, uh, your cheese uh, uh, failures and successes, mate. Um, so what's your favorite cheese to make besides the secret squirrel? Um, anything washed rind. I'm really obsessed with those right now for some reason. Mm. I've, uh, I've done a bunch of, uh, reblechons. Yeah. That's a wonderful washed rind cheese. And I managed to, uh, through a friend of mine, got, get the AOC recipe. Oh, okay. Great. So it has the pH markers, which uh, I'm still working with pH strips because I haven't uh, pH meters about a uh, hundred dollars, which yeah, is a big cheap. thing right now. So, yeah. so I try to measure the pH at every stage, and then it's just the whole act of washing the rind. And um, I don't know, my wife doesn't like the smell coming from them, but I happen to, <laughs> <laughs> I happen to. So yeah. So that sounds and, like a, a fabulous cheese. So, uh, yeah, do you have any other favorites? So, Wash Ryan, do you make Colby? Or is that, no, just, actually, is that just an ordinary uh, cheese? <laughs> uh, I actually am not a fan of Colby. Aren't you? Ever since I, ever since I was a, a kid, it was uh, uh, aged cheddar or or nothing when it came to cheese. Yeah, That's, really? Yeah, well, I'm not I, a fan of the wildness of it. I found, because um, I'd never, I, I made it last year, well, sorry, this year, this year for the first time. And, uh, yeah, the stuff that you can buy in the supermarkets was like, 
It was like soap suds. That's what it kind of tasted like. It was mild, washed out, a bit ordinary. But I found that um, uh, when I made Colby, that the, the flavour was amazing. It was a, a totally... Um, it, look, it was similar to what the commercial stuff, but it had a more depth of flavour, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so I've got a, a couple of friends, and that's her favourite cheese ever, right? So she likes Colby, the commercial version, but when she tried mine... She had a cheese gasm. It was, uh, it was. That's what she called it anyway. So the look on her face was amazing. She said, "This is the best Colby ever." So, so you know, if you can please some of the people some of the time, that's a good thing, I reckon. Yeah. Look, hey, each to their own. If you don't like right. Colby, that's fine, mate. One of my one of my um my wife's favourites currently is um oh what the heck is it called? God, I can't remember the name of the cheese. It's got um. It's like pickled onion cheese. What the heck is it called? Oh, the Cotswold. That's the one. Goodness me. You'd think I make it bloody often enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a fantastic cheese as well. But um, it ripens so well, two and a half months. It's, you know, it's it's quite similar to a um, kefili. Um, Kefili's, you know, three weeks to four weeks. Uh, you can age it longer. It just improves in flavour. But, yeah, an amazing cheese. Nice and quick, nice and simple. Have you tried anything like that? Have you tried adding stuff to your cheese? Uh, yes, I've, I've tried a couple. Um, the one that I liked the most was uh, I did my half and half Carfilio the one time. Um, when I was loading the curd into my mold, I actually put a uh, um, one of my classic mats to have half the cheese with, with just normal curd. And the other half, I actually put some uh, habaneros. Oh, okay, and, chilies, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that turned out brilliantly. And it was, uh, it was actually, I was surprised that the uh, the spiciness from the the chilies didn't migrate over to the other side. But there was a definite split. One half of the cheese was spicy; the other half actually turned out quite uh, quite normal. Oh, okay. I'm I'm tr- trying to visualize this, right? I'm a bit of a visual person. So, in right. your cheese basket, you put a plastic mat down the middle. Right, yes. St- standing um, vertical. Yes. Right, and then you just put so it's like two half cheeses, kind of. So ha- when you pulled it out of the mold, how did that work? Uh, so it, you just pulled the mat out and then just made it. I it just, was. I just pulled the mat out, stuck the follower straight on, and then started pressing. Ah, now I said right. So before the pressing, right. So I was getting confused. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's too early in the morning here. All right, so now, so there's some of your favourite cheeses to make and uh, what what's your favourite ones to eat? And it doesn't have to be the ones that you make. Um, I'm a sucker for a good aged cheddar. I thought um, you didn't, you said well, you grew up on cheddar. I, I know, but it's <laughs> like the good, probably um, six, seven-year-old cheddars. Goodness me. Yeah. Now that I've uh, I've grown to appreciate it, I like the uh, it, it, it's it's funny uh, in Canada we tend to associate cheddar with the the orange block of supermarket cheese. Oh, that rubbish! Yeah, and um, for for us to get the uh, the uh, we call it white cheddar, where it should be just called probably just straight cheddar because it's real. Yeah, they don't add any colors to it. Yeah. Yeah, we get the, uh, you can get, there's a few actual producers here in Canada that make a really nice two, five, seven-year-old cheddars. Mm. And some of them are, are quite nice. And uh, I like that one. Uh, really nice Jarlsberg. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Beaufort. Beaufort is a brilliant cheese. Oh, yes, yes. So that, and, so imported from France or was that made locally there? Oh, uh, it's imported. Yeah. And then uh, um, Rebelchon is is one of my favorites. Your own? And just the 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 Europe uh, the European one. Oh right, but not your own. Yeah. Oh, my own's pretty good, but it's nowhere near uh, <laughs> nowhere near what you can get. Like I will. There's a one cheese shop that's a 45 minute drive from my house. Yeah. It's worth the 45 minutes because they bring in the AOC uh, version. Yeah. Where um. Unfortunately, here in Australia, that uh, imported cheese, that because a lot of it's made with raw milk, they um, they don't let a lot of the raw milk cheeses into the country. They're starting to relax some of the laws now, but uh, for years and years we've been brought up on you know crappy cheddar and 
and that sort of stuff. Very similar to your upbringing. I was the same. We used to cheese was that stuff in a blue box made by a craft with um, yes. aluminium foil wrapped around it. That's what we knew was cheese, and you could keep it in the cupboard. It didn't have to stay in the fridge um, right. during a hot summer. <laughs> so and never and and you know it melted and stuff. But God, my dad used to call it soap suds, and that was his name for the for the blue box cheese. And uh, similar to Parmesan, you know, the stuff in the, the green shaker, you right. know, that, that was what I knew Parmesan as until I made it myself. So, um, But, yeah, it's, it's, we're just starting to get some of the European cheeses and some homegrown um, cheesemakers here in Australia are, are experimenting with raw, cheese, uh, raw milk, so, which is good because they're starting to – I think we've got the same 60-day rule and you've got to mature it at 10 degrees and so – cheeses lie and it's got to be a certain temperature i think it's got to be over 50 degrees celsius when it's cooked um when you're cooking the curds so that only allows things like romano parmesan um gruyere those sort of um uh, high heat um very dense cheeses so they're, they're starting to grow some of those so they're starting to make some of those in tasmania which is good yeah we uh with uh here it's just a straight 60 day and uh, then your your ripening room has to be at a certain temperature as well. So, plus before you can sell uh, any raw milk cheeses here, they have to go away for testing. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, Smoky Valley had their own actual testing, so they could do their own swabs and uh, put it in the incubator, and then uh, check to make sure the count was right and all. They because they were licensed to do that part, they can uh, just make sure whenever the health inspector came in, they saw the records and here's our records. So. Yeah, yeah, you really got to be careful. I know that they've had some cheese scares here in Australia. There was one brand, raw milk, it was pasteurized, and they were their um, E. coli and salmonella counts were through the freaking roof, and I think quite a few people got food poisoned. So you know that always. When I think if a commercial factory can, you know, um, come unstuck like that as well, that when you're making cheese at home, you really got to take care. Um, right. And sanitation, you know, is number one on my list. That's the very first thing I do. Don't skip anything. Start the sanit sanitization process. Clean the sink area, all that good stuff. And then start laying out the ingredients. And it's not, that's the, that's, I don't get the ingredients out first because then you'll be, get, oh, I'll get into it. You know, you know how excited you get when you make your yeah. cheese. Yeah, I would dare say you're the same. I can see the smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, sanitization first, and then I get excited and bring the stuff out. So, so now you say you didn't drink beer very much, but do you have a favorite drink with your cheese? Um, believe it or not, um, I, I, a little red wine sometimes. It doesn't matter what the cheese is. I know some they say you're supposed to pair with white or some you're supposed to pair with red. But I, I think if you've got a wine that you like and you think it matches, then there are some beers I actually do like with uh, with cheese. Yeah. Like a really nice Chimay and uh, Stout is my favorite with cheddar. Because it kind of matches the, the way it was um, um, used in the UK. So, right. yeah, nice deep stout and... Uh, Especially in winter, I wouldn't wouldn't drink sour in summer here. That's for sure. It's more <laughs> like uh, light lagers and cervezas here, <laughs> because it's just too too hot to drink a stout. It'll be a bit heavy on the stomach, I think. <laughs> My friends and I call stout a meal in a can. It is, isn't it? It is. I do make it a car. I make a heavy porter because um, I make my own beer here at home as well, and yeah, in the, or a dark ale is, is probably as as far as I go. I have made stouts when I was when I was in the navy, and uh, yeah, they're really really heavy beers, and you can only drink them in winter. If you drink them in summer, you you're asleep after about two or three, because it just fills, <laughs> fills your belly up. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> no, there isn't. There isn't. Now, can I just ask you one question? Now, I've noticed in in on your blog and some of the things, you use this roasting tray to heat your milk. How does that work? Is, is that oh, different than a double boiler? Is that a, a unique Ian Truer invention, or how does that work? I uh, it's a um, it's an electric countertop roaster. My sister in law yeah, used to use it as a roaster, and she didn't like it, so I told her, "Listen, can I use that as a cheese vat?" <laughs> so, how do you maintain the temperature so low, though? Um, the dial on it allows me to uh, play with the temperature. Right. Um, 
what I actually do to do it, I have instructions on how to make it on the, use it on the website as well. Yeah. Um, essentially what I do is I void the warranty <laughs> on right. it because there's an insert that you, know, you put into the roaster and that's what you put your meat in if you were going to roast it. So when you pull the insert out, there's this lovely well in there that's a sealed unit. I pour water into there and heat the water and use it as a double ah, boiler. Ah, right. I thought you were just, yeah, because I, maybe I didn't read far enough, but I thought you were um, heating the milk directly. I thought the temperature dial, you know, but, so you just heat it to uh, 100 and let the steam heat the milk and then turn it off. Right. Right. Very and then, yeah. uh, and I, and I've, uh, I did a lot of, for lack of a better term, dry runs, heating water in the actual to make sure to get my, um, and on the dial, I have marks on it. Oh, yes. So if I go to one dial, that's how I can heat the milk to the right temperature. If I uh, go to another mark, that's how I maintain the temperature during ripening times. If I turn it a certain uh, to a certain mark, I can increase the temperature by the, the two degrees every five minutes. Oh, and right. Yeah, yeah. That's always it's very tricky. A lot of so a lot of testing, yeah. Yes, yep. and uh, I can do up to 14 litres of milk at once. Oh, that's fantastic. That's big. It's a big, big unit. I looked at it and thought, God, I wish I could get one of those over here. But And uh, a friend of mine who's uh, travelling in India or working in India right now left, lent me uh, his roaster vat, which I showed him how to use. So uh, I've got plans to uh, make an Emmental, which is uh, the recipe calls for 28 litres of milk. So I'll, hopefully I'll have two vats going at the same time. So have you got, you, got the, the, you got the pressing facilities for that? I made my own press. Right, yeah. Um, that uh, it's essentially two cutting boards with some guides. Yeah. And then uh, for the most part, what I do is I uh, fill the, the milk jugs back up with water. And then I can get four milk, uh, four liter milk jugs on, on it. Then I can put a tray. Yeah. On top of the milk jugs. Right. Then I put a couple more milk jugs on top. Right. And then I can put another tray on top and then actually put some actual free weights on top of it. So you can get to about 25 kilos, no problems, easy. Right. Right, cool. So have you, how big are your molds if you're going to do 28 litres? I've got a mold that can hold up to uh, four kilograms of, uh, of curd. Oh, right. Okay. It must be massive. Uh, it's not that big. It's kind of uh, almost like a gouda shape uh, mold. I, I lucked oh, out yeah. and I uh, I ordered it through a, a, one of the suppliers I use, and uh, he said, "Well, the owner said, well, why don't you try this one? It's a little bit more sturdier, and you can get up to a certain amount of uh, weight in it." And I'm like, "Okay, I'll try that one." Yeah, oh, fantastic. Because I used to be a do your own mold kind of guy. So I used yeah. to have a lot of ice cream pails with uh, holes drilled in. So. <laughs> Did that work? Uh, to begin with, but once you start increasing the weight and trying to get a little bit more uh, consistent with your cheeses, I found that it was best to kind of invest, to slowly invest in molds. Yeah, because they're a little bit more rigid than, than normal plastic containers, aren't they? Right, yeah. Yeah, and they, they'll hold their shape a lot better. But yeah, very inventive, Ian. I like that. I had to ask, mate. I had to ask because it had been mystifying me for, for ages on how the heck, if it's a roasting pan, it's going to get up to like 300 degrees Celsius, you know. How the heck do you control it? But, yeah, that water, magic. Yeah, so some final words of encouragement for newbie cheesemakers. Have you got any? Uh, I, I guess my main one is don't be discouraged with uh, early uh, lack of success. Uh, just and even if something you deem something as a as being a failure, try it anyway because you never know. You might have discovered some new cheese that is distinctly your own. And uh, you know, I mean, I wasn't like me not paying attention when I was watching that Havarti. So yeah. I thought at one point it was going to be ruined, and I'm like, well, I've started it. I might as well keep going. Yeah, fabulous. A great advice because. Yeah, you know, I've done the same thing. You know, you, you go along, you start making one cheese and it ends up being something completely different but totally edible and sometimes a serendipitous um, invention really just happens. But that's the great thing about cheese making. Do you agree? Yeah, that's one of the one of the great things. I I uh, I love experimenting and uh, 
I actually had to stop there for a little while because I had uh, probably about four or five little experiments on the go, and uh, one of them went south, and uh, a yeah. couple others were good. But Hey, mate, it's been wonderful talking to you, uh, even though it's freezing cold there and stinking hot here. <laughs> it's been a, a, a mingling of the minds. It's been lovely. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Mate, I've been trying to get you on the show for about a year, so, yeah. <laughs> Time zones kind of clash, seeing you're uh, what eighteen hours behind me or something. Right, it's was Saturday here and it's Sunday there. Yeah, it's Sunday morning at ooh ten thirty or something. Yeah, it's four thirty in the afternoon here. Yeah, so, it's on a, Saturday. Pretty hard. So you got to do it on a weekend. You got to find a weekend that's free. So, no, that's right. cool. Thanks for making the time, Ian. It's been fantastic chatting to you, and uh, may all your tr- cheese dreams come true, mate. Oh, thank you. You too. <laughs> Thanks very much. See you later. Cheers. Well, I hope you agree that uh, the interview was very enlightening. Um, Ian has made some wonderful cheeses there, and I particularly like the sound of the little squirrel, or the secret squirrel, <laughs> as it was first called. Um, I'm going to put the link up on the show notes. Um, I'll also put a few more links up there and a picture of of the little squirrel cheese as it first turned out and the link definitely to Ian's blog, Much To Do About Cheese. Well, thanks very much for listening, folks. There's the outro music. That's the end of this episode. So for upcoming workshop dates, and they don't start again until March, uh, you can find those on littlegreencheese.com. You can also find my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. And that's available in all ebook formats. And you can find further details on littlegreencheese.com. You can also find all my cheese making video tutorials within the ebook or on my YouTube channel. Just search for Greening of Gavin. So thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next exciting episode of Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop and Call to the Dairy Cows. <laughs>